Manscaped has the men's grooming market down pat. Their Lawnmower 4.0 is the most revolutionary body hair trimmer on the market. They also have amazing products like their Crop Reviver, their Crop Preserver. They have a new body wash. They have a new shampoo and conditioner. They have a nose and ear hair trimmer. They have a cologne. Manscaped is really the one-stop shop for all your men's grooming needs. So go to manscaped.com and use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have Melanie Curtin. She is a sex researcher and coach with a master's from Stanford. She uses data to help men and couples communicate about sex with one another so they can have hotter sex more frequently. Melanie is a former columnist at Inc.com, where her pieces garnered over 10 million page views worldwide. And she has been published or seen on Today, Huffington Post, Forbes Business Insider, The New York Observer, and more. She has helped men have the sex lives they have always wanted, and by extension, their women as well. Short term, she teaches men how to have more sex and better sex with women by teaching them how to truly please women in bed. And I think that she's going to have some wonderful piece of advice for all of us. So let's welcome Melanie. Hi, Melanie. How are you? I'm well, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Of course. So I was actually a guest on Melanie's podcast first. So if you guys want to check that out, Melanie, can you tell them where they can, can find it? Yes. It's called Dear Men, How to Rock Sex, Dating, and Relationships. And it's found everywhere you find podcasts, Spotify, iTunes, all the things. Fantastic. So today we're going to talk about you as much as I love to talk about me. I think today we're going to, we're going to talk about you. So, uh, you started off working in marketing and journalism before you launched your sex research and coaching company. What made you decide to make that jump? That's a great question. I actually started off as a, um, an advocate for survivors of sexual abuse. So actually before I was in marketing and journalism, I actually co-founded a nonprofit to stop sexual abuse in the Jewish community in New York City. One of my male friends was a survivor and we started a nonprofit and we trained mothers on the signs and symptoms of abuse. And it was sort of like a Tupperware party. So we would have one mom host in her house and we would bring in a therapist and then at the end of the, the four to six sessions, another mom would host in her house. So it sort of spread through the community that way. And eventually I came to realize that in order to stop abuse, we actually need to establish a healthy sexual culture. So I moved kind of from the pathology side into the, how do we actually do that? How do we help people have more openness and expression through their sexuality in a healthy way so that it doesn't become abusive. And there's a lot more to that conversation, but that's not really what we're talking about today. So I sort of moved from that into journalism and then I kind of moved back into the sexuality space after a few years. I love that you bring that up because that ties into so much of what I talk about with the adult industry. Um, you know, one of the main, one of the many criticisms that I get is, you know, that I'm just by having a show about porn and talking about porn, I'm perpetuating like this rape culture and exploiting women and all that kind of stuff. And, and what I'm always trying to emphasize and what my guests talk about is exactly what you just said, being more open about sexuality, talking about sexuality, trying to create healthy conversations around sexuality, because it's when you repress sex and when you repress expression and education that the abuse rears its ugly head. So um, I'm so happy to hear you say that. Yes. There's actually research showing that children who know the correct names of their body parts are less likely to be sexually abused or molested. And I think that part of that is because the kinds of parents who teach their children about their body are the kinds of parents who it's safe to tell. And it's safe Mm -hmm. to talk about 
sexuality and things that make you feel icky or weird. It's just, it's, there's a safe sexual culture in a house that's talking about our whole body part, all of our body parts, right? Including our private parts and the families where it's, it's weird, it's locked down. It feels, you can feel the tension and the, the sort of fear response around it. That's less safe for all of us. So I couldn't support your work more. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I love to hear that. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you do and in your coaching. Yeah. So I right now work mainly with men who have sex with women. And primarily, I would say about half of my clients are men who sort of never, never figured out how to relate with women well. <laughs> so 20s, 30s, 40s, um, men who've maybe not had a lot of success with women in general, or have gone through a breakup and figured out that there's something going on. There's something, there's something wrong and they need help with that. And then another half of my clientele are married. Um, I would say somewhat unhappily kind of exploring, is there something wrong in the marriage that I can address? Is it time to leave? You know, a lot of those are sexless marriages. I deal with a lot of men that are kind of unhappy in their sex lives with their partners. And I co-coach with my friend, Jason. So we work as a team to help men kind of coming from both sides of the, the women's experience and the male experience. And our program is actually a group program. So I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of support and depth in getting a group of men together that are willing to be open and having men actually feel not as alone. That feels like a big part of what we do is, is establishing the community and the support around the men so that they can make decisions like, am I going to leave this marriage? And the stakes are really high for a lot of those men because many of them have children and they have established lives with this partner. And sometimes they've been told, oh, you only want sex. You just, you know, you're so obsessed with sex. Why is this so important? Why can't this just be this thing over here on the side that we don't really do, <laughs> right? They've been shamed, a lot of them, for their sexuality. And they're not, it's not part of their relationship with their wife. And that's a problem because when you've made a monogamous vow, then you're kind of stuck in this position of feeling helpless and frustrated. Like if I'm not getting this need met from you, what am I supposed to do, right? If I can't go outside the marriage and I'm not getting this need met with you, I feel really stuck. So I work with a lot of clients kind of in that position as well. And that is a problem that we see just perpetuated in so many relationships. I mean, you know, there's constantly making jokes about that on TV. Um, you know, just it, it's, it's, it seems like every marriage is destined for the women to lose interest in sex, especially after having kids, the men to continue to have interest in sex. And there is this huge divide. And then the man isn't getting sex from the marriage. He gets it from somewhere else. He ends up cheating. There's a betrayal and the marriage explodes. I mean, how do you rectify this problem? And is it true actually that women just don't like sex as much as men and is every no. <laughs> marriage destined for that? No. Um, I think that there's a lot, there are a lot of pieces to that conversation. One thing that I've found repeatedly is to kind of go back to the first conversation, there's actually a lot more sexual trauma than we think. And I'm not excluding men, you know, it's one in six boys and one in three girls under the age of 18 will be sexually abused. And that's millions and millions of people. So there are many relationships where one or both parties has trauma, sexual trauma, and they haven't healed it. They haven't really explored it. And it takes a lot of courage to do that. And what I've seen is, for example, um, one of my women friends, uh, she didn't have sexual abuse trauma, but she had kind of religious trauma around sex, which I think actually a lot of my clients have had as well. And I think you've, you've talked about, <laughs> and oh, yeah. to make a long story short, she, when she met her, her husband, they, they did have sex at the beginning and, but she wasn't really enjoying it. She enjoyed that he enjoyed it and she cared about him. And so she kind of, this shows up in my research a lot of a woman who will grin and bear it a little bit. She was kind of, I would say putting on an act, but a little bit like she enjoyed the power of sexuality, but she didn't really enjoy 
sex. She wasn't really in her body. She was disassociating for a lot of the time, which is a thing that a lot of people will do. They're, they're physically there, but they're not really in their body for the whole experience. And to make a very long story short, you know, sex was an issue in their marriage for a decade, maybe 12 years. And then they ended up getting divorced. And that was a big part of why. And after they got divorced, that's when she really started exploring herself and her sexuality because she knew this was, that I have to get this handled if I want to be in a healthy, lasting relationship because I can't, I can't go through that again. So I think there's a lot of people that don't realize that they have trauma, that they haven't really worked through yet. And this is where it's showing up. It's showing up in relationship. And there's a certain willingness that has to be there in both parties to grow. And that's really something I focus on with my clients when they're evaluating, do I stay with this partner or not? Is is this partner willing to grow? Are you two willing to grow together? And not everyone is. There are some partners that are not they don't want to do it. <laughs> they don't want yeah. to look at the dark, scary places. They don't want to go there. And I've had clients in both situations where one client where his wife got a somatic therapist, you know, she started going to women's circles. She, she worked on her stuff and he was working on his too. And then I've had clients where the woman is, she doesn't want to do it. She doesn't, she's not about that life. She's not interested. She just wants him to kind of get over it. <laughs> There's a way that she just wants him to kind of why is sex so important to you? Why can't you just, you know, like all the things we talked about, why, why are you so obsessed with this? She doesn't want to look at the, the part that she's playing in that pattern. She thinks that it's all him and it's, it's all on him. And if he could just kind of get that handled. And I even have clients where the, the woman will say, I don't, I don't care if you go outside the marriage. I don't mind if you get that need met somewhere else. And that's not enough for him because what he really wants is the intimacy. He wants the sex, but he wants the closeness. And that's a thing that I think is often missed. And, and something I feel protective of in men is that all of the men I work with want sex and they don't just want sex. They want sex and closeness. And I think there's a way that we kind of denigrate men and say, oh, all you want is sex when really we're missing that there's, there's a need there for intimacy. There's a need there for closeness. And I think that you know, a lot of your guests have spoken to that, including sex workers who, who say it's not just that this man wants to fuck. It's that he, so he wants to talk. <laughs> he wants to connect. He wants to feel connection. That's the mm -hmm. drive. That's the need. It's not just P and the V, right? It's, it's, it's more than that. And I think that that sometimes gets lost in the conversation. That's so true. And I've heard that come up so many times with men is that, you know, men, communicate through sex and they communicate closeness and intimacy through sex. And, and I think women don't always see that all of the time. Um, you mentioned about some women saying, you know, that they didn't care if the man went outside the marriage to get his needs met. Have you ever found that polygamy, um, or I'm uh, sorry, I should say polyamory. Polyamory. Um, yeah. yeah. Polyamory, not polygamy. Um, <laughs> we're not. In Utah, uh, <laughs> um, which by the way is a beautiful place. I just visited there. So nothing against Utah. It's fantastic mountains. Wow. Gorgeous. Bryce Canyon kicked my butt. I also got COVID there, but that's another story. So, um, <laughs> I have but yes, in Utah, it's funny. <laughs> Polyamory. Does that actually work for some couples? Is that the solution for some people? I'm a big fan of polyamory. I have a lot of friends in my life who choose poly as their lifestyle. I don't think it works for everyone. I think that our sexual culture would be much healthier if it was much more mainstream than it is. For example, I have friends that are poly who aren't out to their colleagues because they know they'll be judged. Uh, there's still a lot of, there's still a lot of strictures around sexuality in our culture. We think, I think we think we're more progressive than we actually are, especially in North America. And so, but I think that poly can really help in a lot of ways. And it's not a magic pill, right? When you're dealing with a couple and they're having attachment issues or there's something going on in their sex life, just going out and finding another partner isn't going to fix that connection. So I think it's an and, and I also think that there is a lot of freedom 
that's possible there. And I've, I've had conversations with a couple of my male friends who are divorced and said, you know, do you think that if you'd had an outlet when you and your wife were having problems, do you think that would have helped? And they've all said yes, because they said, I think I would have felt less sort of pent up and stressed and anxious in my body. And that would have helped me ha maybe have difficult conversations or be willing to go to therapy or whatever else, because they wouldn't have been so kind of crunchy in their body mm -hmm. and holding all of this tension. Cause I think that that's, yeah, I think that sex is an important way to, to move that energy and to release tension. And, you know, again, I don't think that it's just physical. I think it's the physicality and connection that's helping kind of regulate a man's nervous system. So I'm a big fan of poly. I think that it is a healthy choice. I don't think it's great for everyone, but I do think that we would all be better off if it was more accepted and more explored with more of us, especially because I think that the poly community has a lot more guidance around consent conversations, agreements, you know, they, they're kind of processing emotions as they go along. It, there, there's just more of a container and a culture of talking about things like jealousy and what are our agreements today? Does that feel good? We're about to go to this play party together. What are our agreements, boundaries, and desires? Like they'll have a conversation before they go to a play party about that. What couple, what straight vanilla couple does that? No one's doing that. It's not part of the culture. And so things tend to simmer and resentments build and there's just, there's not as much open communication. So I think there's a lot to be said for, yeah, there's a lot to be said for Polly. That's really, um, that's really interesting because I had a, a great guest, uh, Jet Set Jasmine, who's an adult performer and also a therapist, and she's in a Polly relationship. And I am not, I'm in a monogamous relationship. Um, that's just always what's worked for me. So it was really interesting for me to learn from her that their rules and their boundaries change depending on what's happening in their lives. And, and I didn't realize that like, oh, you can like, you know, move the lines around and you can like, you know, decide that now this works for us as opposed to last year. And, you know, she talked about like when she was pregnant, like how they, you know, things shifted when she was pregnant or when she felt like she needed him more, um, at certain times because of whatever. And, and I was, I was really interested by that. I was like, Oh wow. And, and you're right because this brings up this need for like a constant engagement and constant conversation around sex and around boundaries when you're right. Like a straight vanilla couple, like myself and my husband, to be honest, like we don't have those conversations. Right. 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 Cause it's, so, right, so there's true. a way that it's alive, you know, the, in, in the poly relationship, it's, it's constantly alive. It's what are we, mm -hmm. what are we wanting and needing now? Maybe that's right. not the same as it was two months ago. And I think that's a, right. that's a beautiful example of I'm pregnant. I'm feeling a little vulnerable. I'd like to close our container for a while. That would make mm -hmm. me feel more secure. It's like, I got you. Yes. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's fluid. It doesn't need to be rigid. And I think right. that that's, that's something that has also surprised me in witnessing my poly friends is how fluid the boundaries are, right? It's like, I'm going on vacation. Let's talk about what, what's going to happen. And, you know, it's not always realistic to say, Hey, I'd like to hook up with this person. You know, let's, let's agree beforehand what's going to happen so that you don't have to ruin the flow when you're connecting with a new person. And yeah. I think there's something really freeing for a lot of people about, wow, I could, I could still be all of me and be in partnership. Cause I think for a lot of folks, it can feel like I have to cut off these parts of me to be in a monogamous relationship. I'm not allowed to flirt with anyone else. I'm not allowed to make out with anyone else. I'm, I'm sort of, I'm in this box over here. And sometimes that can cut off really beautiful parts of ourselves. And mm -hmm. I think there's, yeah, there's there, it can be scary, <laughs> right? Well, what if I lose you? R what if you go hook up with someone else and you like them better and I lose you? And I think that those are, conversations to be had and people lose each other in monogamy world too. There's no, there's no, it's a, it's an illusion that there's an Island of safety somewhere. It, you know, we're always growing and changing as human beings and we're always connecting with new people. So there's no perfect safety anywhere. The, the safety is in the connection, in healthy connection and being able to talk through things and actually hold space for each other. That's the safety, ironically, not who you're having sex with or not having sex with at what time. Yeah. Yeah. I know that absolutely makes sense. Um, 
In your sex research, what did you find that men said their biggest sex problem was? And what did you find that women said their biggest sex problem was? Yeah. So this is a great question. So I was really curious about, I sort of started my sex research just because I was curious about things and wanted to know whether other people were having the same experience. And so one of the research pieces I did was around top problems. And I asked people what their top sex problems were, their top dating problems, their top relationship problems. And I would say a good 90% of the folks who responded were heterosexual and then some pansexual, bisexual, people identified all different kinds of ways. When I was looking at the overall patterns, what I saw for a lot of the men was that their top problem was essentially access and the feeling of hunger. I'm hungry. I wish I had more of it. I crave more of it. I want more of it. You know, my, my top problems are finding a partner or getting my partner to do the things that I want to do, um, or even just getting my partner to be interested again. <laughs> so there was a lot of kind of hunger and eating that word even came up. I'm hungry or I'm starving for sex. And there was a desperation. There was a feeling of desperation that kind of came through. And that wasn't true for everyone, but that was a top problem for men. And then for women, actually, it's interesting because this tracks with my experience um, hooking up with and having sex with lots of men. I'm a woman who has sex with men. And in my experience, many men were too rough with their hands um, too fast. And so I didn't get a chance to be turned on. And, and in addition to not being turned on, what they were doing was often painful. And so if you're, you know, rubbing the clit too hard when it's not wet, it can hurt. Uh, if you're digitally penetrating her right away, that can hurt. Um, it, it, so what I found was the number one sex problem for women was it hurts number one. And that was showing up in less than 2% of the men. So this is not the same on both sides. And I think it's one of the most important things for men to know, because, you know, I teach a course for men called Please Her in Bed. And one of the first kind of sections of it is actually about creating a safe space for her to share. Because what I, what I found in my own sex life, which again, tracked a lot with the research was, I was always afraid to speak up. I was always afraid to say, ow, that kind of hurts. Like, could you back off a little bit? Because I didn't want to piss him off. That's the honest truth was I was afraid. I was scared that if I said anything that came across as critical, if he, if he got, if he felt like it was criticism, I would be punished and I would, you know, he would lash out. I was always afraid that a man would say, oh, you don't like how I do it? Well, fuck you then. I don't have to do it anymore. And that fear was so big in my, in my head that I would often not say anything and, and just grin and bear it, right? I would just tolerate the pain and sort of hope we'd get to something else that didn't hurt as much. And that was very common in the research. A lot of women said that. And I also asked, you know, partners, both sides, I said, if you, if something wasn't working in your sex life, why didn't you say something? Like, what was stopping you from saying something? And the number one response from women was, I didn't want to hurt his feelings. I didn't want to hurt his feelings. And I think that that's, uh, I think that's layer one, right? Because that's true for me too. I would say, oh, I didn't want to hurt his feelings. Underneath that is, I was afraid of getting attacked. Or a lot of women said, I was afraid if I said something, he would just withdraw, go away and leave the relationship. That he, would, that he would leave me. So I think it's really important that men understand just how afraid women are to actually expressly share. And so what I teach is how men can invite, invite us to share, because I think that's really magical and can create a lot of connection. And it's just, it's so prevalent, you know, it's so prevalent in the research. It's so common for women to say, I'm, I'm terrified. That's why I don't speak up. You know, I did one of those scale of one to 10, how hard is it for you to speak up about something that's not working in your sex life? And the numbers were much higher for women. It was harder for more women than, than for men. And I think that that's something that can really 
just be so healing for women as well. If a man says, listen, I always want this to feel good for you. I always want to know if something's not working or if, if anything, if anything ever hurts, because just his awareness of that being a major issue relaxes me. <laughs> just his knowledge that that's a thing makes me feel relaxed. And I've worked with a lot of men who, you know, I've asked how their sex life is and how the responses they've gotten. And they're like, oh yeah, I, you know, I'm pretty good at sex. And then they take my course and they're like, I think I was pretty bad. <laughs> I think I was pretty bad based on what I just learned. And then they, and then there was one guy that took my course and he um, slept with a woman or he went down on a woman that he'd seen in the past previously. And she said, what happened? <laughs> So I do think that there's a lot of room for improvement and it doesn't actually take as much as you might think. Yeah. You know, th what you just said, first of all, I relate to so hard because 100% I have done the same for me. I, I didn't have that second layer of, of fear of being attacked, which, um, thank God. And I'm sorry that, that, that was something that was even on your mind. But for me, it was definitely about hurting his feelings. And, you know, I think before I got into my current relationship, um, with my husband, you know, when I was out there and single and like just having sex with lots of guys and usually pretty drunk most of the time, um, I, and I think also too, I mean, I'll admit, I think that working in the porn industry also kind of like set me up in this unhealthy way to think about like, okay, well, I need to perform like a porn star. Right. <clears throat> and, and I will say, um, that I, I think, and this is though, I think because we don't talk about sex and there's no sex education, we don't communicate around it. So men and got, unfortunately children now are learning about sex from porn, which is a fantasy. That's not real life. That is not like how real people usually connect. And again, though, a caveat that I want to say is like, not all porn is like the porn that I'm talking about. There's lots of porn that, that is about people connecting and about bringing the women pleasure and long, um, you know, a, a long, uh, interlude of foreplay before sex happens. So, so I don't want to say like all porn is like this because that's something that I always speak against, but anyways, sorry, going off on a tangent. But my point is, is that I think that when I was out there, I was like, I want to you, and you spoke earlier about women kind of like for, for them, sex was kind of like power, right? Like we have power over men with our sexuality and, and we use that a lot because we know that's something that men want. And so we want to perform in this way that, um, I think makes us feel like we're more valuable. Like, Oh my God, if I'm really good in bed, he's going to like me more. It doesn't really matter that I'm not really enjoying this. If this hurts a little bit, all it matters is my performance so that he likes me because this is what's really important to men. Um, so yeah, I, I relate to that so hard. And for me, that's definitely what I was thinking. And it was only, I mean, I'll be honest. It was only really after I kind of started doing this podcast and I started talking to people about this and, and about communicating in sex and, and guests like you that I came to realize that my own sex life was lacking in communication. And I wasn't talking about the things that I wanted either. And I was sticking to this role that I had created for myself when I was younger, which was like, and, and I did enjoy it at the time. Like I like BDSM, my life for sex. I want to be choked and all that stuff. I don't actually really like it that much anymore. I've changed. I'm older and, um, it's not really all that exciting for me anymore. I would like softer, more gentle, more intimate. Um, and I've only kind of, you know, recently in the last few years been able to communicate that. So, um, yeah, just, uh, I definitely relate to all of that. Yeah. Um, that's something that I saw actually in the research was the range, what, you know, what women want in bed is actually a range. So it's not just one side or the other. I sort of talk about it as the dark side and the light side of sexuality. And it's, it's not that women only want one side or the other. It's like, we want both. We want what the moment calls for, what the energy, what the actual flow of the moment is. And so there's some men that can only play on the light side of sexuality, right? The soft touch, the intimacy, the eye contact, the, all of that. And it was funny in the research, some of the, what did this one woman say? She said, I feel like you make love to me like I'm your sister. I want you to fuck me sometimes. And there were a lot of women that said something like that, where you could, you could feel their desire for his fire, right? Mm -hmm. Versus 
a man who doesn't really have access to his heart where it's like, I want to feel you more. I want to feel you. I know, you, you know, I can feel that you're fucking me, but I don't feel you here with me. I want that depth and that presence and that eye contact. Right. So I think, yeah, a full, beautiful range is when sex is really satisfying because you have mm -hmm. all of the colors available to paint with instead of just one side of the palette. And I think your point is really good too about what we want shifts and changes as we grow and we go through seasons. Sometimes we do want it rougher or harder, or, you know, sometimes we want it lighter and softer. And it's, it's, it's a, a little bit like we were talking about the woman who was pregnant of what's happening in your life. What are you needing right now in the moment? How are you in your body right now? And that attunement is so hot when you have a partner that where you're attuned to you and they're attuned to you too. It's, there's just, there's a lot of potency there. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break and then we're going to come back. We're going to talk about how uh, porn affects sex life. Is, is porn good for your sex life? Is it bad? Um, and so much more. So hang tight. We'll be right back. If you've been a longtime listener of my podcast, then you've heard me talk about Manscaped. And I'm going to keep talking about Manscaped because it really is the best men's electric body trimmer out there. Their new Lawnmower 4.0 has advanced skin safe technology that will help eliminate nicks, snags, and cuts. But that's not all Manscaped is offering. They've also introduced body wash infused with aloe vera and sea salt to keep your whole body smelling and feeling great. And they have shampoo and conditioner guaranteed to hydrate and keep your hair staying strong. So guys, if you want to clean up your act, make sure that you check out Manscaped and all their amazing products that they have to offer. And better yet, you can get 20% off plus free shipping when you go to their website, manscaped.com, and use code HRU for your special offer. That's manscaped.com. Use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. Hi, everybody. We are back. So, Melanie, what was your most surprising research finding? That's a great question. Um, so one thing I asked people was, have you ever broken up with someone because of the sex? And this was, again, partly out of my own experience. I was in a relationship with a man that I, I really liked and I was scared to talk about sex. And sex wasn't the only reason that I broke it off, but it was a big reason because I remember thinking, this isn't the sex that I want for the rest of my life. If this is the person that I'm going to commit to, this isn't this isn't working for me. And I want to touch on one thing quickly before I get to the surprise, which is I think that there's a lot of I think there can be a lot of pressure on women to speak up. It, right? It seems like the easy solution is well, women should just talk about what's not working. You know, obviously it's on you if it's not working for you, you should say something. We're pretty afraid. We've covered that. And my experience with this man and with a few men was I did speak up especially around fingering, I was like, Hey, you know, kind of, it numbs me out with too much pressure. So I'd love just less pressure, less pressure. And he adjusted for a few minutes and then he went back to doing it the way he had been doing it. And that was very consistent. That was what I tended to find with men was if I did sort of overcome my fear and say something, they would adjust for a little while, either a few minutes that encounter or that one sexual encounter, and then they would go back to the way they'd been doing it. And that was a problem because I then felt like a nag. I felt like if I speak yeah. up again, if I say something again, and I keep saying oh, lighter, 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 less pressure, less pressure, less, I felt like I would be nagging. And that's not hot at all. And so I tended to <laughs> shut down and I just, I gave up basically. And that phrase gave up, showed up in the research a lot with women. When I asked them about, you know, if your sex life wasn't working, did you say something? If so, if not, why not? They said, I did say something <laughs> and then it didn't work. And that made me feel even worse. And so I sort of shut down. So I think that there's, there's also something just for men to know that if you ever do get an adjustment or if you elicit something and she shares, pay really close attention because a lot of the time when she says something like lighter or less pressure, it might actually mean, ow, that, that hurts. And 
um, I really like you to not do it again. <laughs> right. So mm -hmm. she might be saying it at a two when really it's an eight. So it's just good to know about that. So again, back to that question of, have you ever broken up with someone because of the sex? So what, my prediction for this was that absolutely more men will have broken up with women over sex versus vice versa, because I think that we're trained to believe that sex is more important to men than it is to women. And so 49% of men said, yes, I've broken up with someone because of the sex. And this included marriages. This wasn't just relationships. This was also marriages. And I saw that number and I thought, okay, 49%. So probably the women's number will be 26%, something like half around that. It was not. It was 61% of women. Wow. 61% had broken up with a man or their partner, but m m m much of my audience and the participants were hetero, um, had broken up with a man because of the sex. And when I actually looked at the number, I did the you could write in, there was a write in option. And so a full 3% of, of women wrote in and many of them said, I've never done it before, but I'm thinking about doing it now. So I think the number is higher. I think it's closer to 64% of women. And that blew me away. I was blown away. I didn't think that that would be true. And again, when I actually looked at the data and what those women were saying, it's a lot of what we're talking about, which is I was scared to speak up. I, it wasn't the sex I wanted to have for the rest of my life. Or I, had, I did try to speak up and I felt really shut down by him. There was a woman who said something like, he was so emotionally fragile that he would bring up what I said in public to shame me. So wow. I think that, that, that a lot of those fears that women have are founded and there are men who will respond poorly to feedback. And I have a theory about this, which is that I think that in our culture, men are, are expected to be really good at sex. And I think they have a lot of their identity wrapped up in being good at sex. And so it feels like if I'm not good at sex, I'm less of a man. And so any kind of criticism, I'm putting air quotes on that because it's not really criticism, it's feedback, right? It's I would like less pressure. I would love a lighter touch. It's not really criticism, but it can be interpreted as, hey, you're bad at this. And that I think gets conflated in a man's head as you're less of a man, right? That it feels emasculating to him to receive that feedback or it can, because it's like, I'm expected to be good at this. If you're telling me I'm not good at this, it means I'm not enough of a man, right? There's all kinds of jokes about a man who can't make a woman come. Men know that this is important, but they're not really taught how to do it. And because so many women are afraid to speak up, they think that what they're doing is working, right? You, you hook up with 15 women, nobody seemed to have a problem. And Holly, to your point, a lot of us women are really good at performing it. We know mm -hmm. what it's supposed to sound like. We know what it's supposed to look like. We know we're supposed to move and writhe and moan and make noises. And, you know, my research, as much sex research shows, lots of women are faking it lots of the time. And so if you're a man just kind of doing your thing, it's easy to miss that actually a lot of women aren't experiencing pleasure. Now, that's resolvable, right? All of the things that we're talking about and things that I teach in my course are how to kind of elicit her feedback and actually welcome it instead of kind of defend against it. You know, every woman's body is different. It's kind of like cars. Every car has the same parts, well, except for Teslas, they have different parts, but most cars <laughs> have a transmission and they have a steering wheel and they have brakes and they have all the things, but every car is a little different. Right. This car is a little weird when you back it up this way or this car's window doesn't work this certain way. Everyone's car is a little bit different. So if you think about a woman or your woman as a car, you want you want to get to know that car. How does that car get turned on? What's going on with that car and becoming an expert at eliciting that in listening and attuning and really becoming with that partner. And yeah, drawing her out, coaxing her out that is invaluable and you, you can do it. It's not, it's not impossible. So that was really surprising to me. And the other thing that I found really surprising was, um, I asked women about the men who were best in bed. And one of the things that kept coming up again and again was actually not about the bedroom itself or what was going on sexually. It was, he put attention on me during the day. He texted me sexy things. He, it, it, there was a, there so many women talked about 
the experience before the encounter. And again, this is whether or not this pair is married. This includes married folks, not just people that are single or dating. It's the feeling of being desired as a woman, right? He made me feel desired. And so the attention that you're putting on a woman over the course of the day or the, the pre-encounter, it counts, right? Women, women talked about that when they talked about the men who are best in bed. And I think a lot of us, when we think about being good in bed, we're just thinking about the actual time between the sheets. But for a lot of women, it's the attention beforehand. That's part of the turn on, part of the on-ramp, you know, onto the freeway. Mm. And I think that that's the main difference in terms of men who are good versus not is their awareness of that on-ramp. They, you know, you're probably familiar with this, but physiologically, it takes men about seven minutes to come to full arousal. I mean, all systems go, lots of blood everywhere. You know, it's like not gross blood, like blood flow, like really nice yeah, yeah. to talk. Like everything's Understood. happening. It's all good. <laughs> and you would think for women, it'd be like, oh, it's 14 minutes. It's double the time. Nope. It's 21 minutes. It's triple the time. Nope. It can be up to 45 minutes. It's 25 to 45 minutes for a woman to come to full arousal. It's so much longer <laughs> than it takes men. <laughs> And I think the men that are good in bed know that. And so they take their time. They're slow. They're present. They're, they're doing lots of kissing. They're doing lots of touching. There's just more time for her to get wet. And then everything's going to be more pleasurable versus just going straight to it, which is a perfect segue into porn, which I think a lot of times sort of models the just going straight to it. And so then men think, Oh well, that's how that's how women turn women's turn on works. And look, that she's enjoying it. She's obviously enjoying it. So that must be how, <laughs> how women work. When most of the time, it's just too much, too fast for actual real life women. And I'd I'd love to hear your thoughts on that particular part as a as someone in the industry. Yeah, I mean, so before we we get into the the porn part, I just wanted to mention um, the onboard. You know, sorry, the onboard, the on ramp. Um, idea, I think is, is that's a great analogy because, you know, I think about like, because there were sexual encounters that I've had, and I think we've all had them where it was somebody new, you know, usually someone new, someone you've been crushing on a lot and you guys like finally got together and there's been all this tension that's been building up and it suddenly like explodes and you're like wet right away and you're ready and you want to go at it hard and fast and that kind of stuff. But that is like this kind of flirty foreplay that's been happening for a long time. Right. So that, that is exactly what you're talking about that, you know, flirty text attention to the woman throughout the day. Um, you know, and that's how that kind of turns into this hot and heavy, like wet right away thing. And there's, there's still this foreplay. It's just not like the typical foreplay that you would think of in the bedroom with candles lit and a long massage and that kind of stuff. It's a foreplay that's maybe been building up over days, maybe over weeks, whatever. So, um, that's just kind of what I thought of when you talked about, um, the on-ramp, um, uh, yeah. and that that's totally a great, so much it's a great point. And it's, and it's, again, it's sort of what we're talking about with the range. It's not that I don't love a quickie. I do love a quickie. I just don't love a quickie every single time. And I think yeah. that's to your point, uh, you know, a man that has the hot and heavy sex right away, uh, you know, they've been flirting, they've been doing their thing. It's like, oh, well, that must be the way she likes it. Or, well, it works like that last time. So that must be how it works all the time. And it's not really true, right? It does take more time. And back to the pressure thing, you know, you know, those word clouds when you, you have lots of data and the big, big words. So, <laughs> In my course, I have a couple word clouds for the men who were not so good in bed and then the men who were really good in bed. And for the men who were not so good, fast and rough were huge words. Women just kept saying it over and over. They were too fast and too rough, too fast, too rough. This is fingers, tongue, cock, all of it, not just P and the V. And the men who were good, it was slow and the word time because many women said he took his time. He took time with me. He took time. And that I think is that buildup. There was a, there was a slower buildup because he took some time and that's part of the, yeah, the, the skill of a man who's really talented is he, um, he really understands that he grasps that, that sometimes when there's been lots of buildup, a quickie is great. And most of the time it takes more time. 
And so even the pressure that you're using, right, as women's genitalia fills up with blood, as we get more turned on, as we get more excited, we will want more pressure. So it's not even that the pressure you're using is too much. It's just too much right now right? It's too much Mm. at the beginning. But as she gets turned on, I mean, that's part of why, you know, fisting is a thing. You can't just fist someone right away. They have to be turned on, right? There's a, there's an on-ramp there. But when you're, when you are turned on, man, the pussy is incredible. It can take lots of pressure. It can take a lot. It can take a lot. It's just not right away. It's like building a fire. You got to get the kindling. You got to get the tinder. You got to get all of that going. And then you can put on the big log. Yeah. You can't, there's no hurrying fisting. (laughs) I feel like I need to put that on a shirt. Don't hurry (laughs) fisting. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, and then coming back to porn and this is something that, you know, we bring up time and time again that, you know, porn is a fantasy and porn is, is not necessarily a guide. And again, when I say porn, I don't mean all porn. I mean, most porn. Um, but you know, what we're producing is content for people to, usually it's to masturbate to, right. And usually it's for men and men generally watch porn, I think for an average of like 10 minutes or something like that. So when we do, when we film a sex scene, I mean, when I get the script, it's usually like, (laughs) it's kind of funny. We always joke about this. We spend about like my days are usually 10 to 12 hours. We spend about eight hours on the intro and about 30 minutes on the sex. Really? Um, Yes. So my clients generally want 30 minutes of like actual sex. And that's really more so so people can kind of skip around to different parts that they might want to watch. But generally people don't watch porn for an incredibly long time. So Usually I don't have the time, nor do people have the attention span, especially in today's culture to shoot 45 minutes of foreplay. Yep. Yep. Right. But this is like what you just said that, um, a lot of women may need as much time as that to get turned on. So, you know, when we're shooting a scene, um, they might be getting right into sex and the girl may seem like she's ready right away. Well, she could be ready right away. Sometimes they don't need lube, but also keep in mind, I just said that we were filming for like eight hours before we get to the sex. So if there's chemistry between the performers, they may have been building that up over the eight hours. That we've got to shoot all this fucking dialogue that everybody fast forwards through. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so there's that. So, so that, that could be the on-ramp as well. Or in most cases we stop and we use lube because the girl isn't wet. Um, and I have a whole package of all different kinds of lube. I got silicone lube. I got water-based lube because everybody has their preferred lube. So, um, yeah, what we're creating is a fantasy. What we're creating is a performance and sometimes it is very real and sometimes it is very hot. I mean, I've literally had scenes that I've shot where I've had, I've called cut. The performers don't fucking hear me. They're in their own world. I I've had to like peel people apart. I'm like, excuse me. We need to change the light. Can you just stop for a second? That's this a is great, very, that's a this story. is not common though. This is not common at all. Most of the time we stop. Okay. We got to check their phone, go to the bathroom, like fix their makeup. Like, so it's, it's so, you know, it's, it's a production. And so if you're going to go by what you see in porn and that's going to be your guide as to what women want, especially because most porn is shot with a male gaze in mind, um, it's just not accurate. And that's why I think, you know, this neat, cause it is entertainment. Let's take it for what it's worth and let's enjoy it for what it's worth. But let's balance that with, you know, people with messages like you, Um, I mean, this course that you teach sounds great. Let's balance it with like real information from real women. Let's balance it with education, um, data and communication and, um, you know, all porn and like, you know, sex education are, are usually two different things, but like they can coexist if we can like recognize that, you know, porn is what it is. It serves a purpose. And then, And then there's like real life intimate sex, which is usually quite different. Yes. And I think it's really encouraging. It can be really encouraging for men to know 
you know, what actual women want and don't want, for example, I think it was less than 5% of women talked about a man staying hard for a long time, less than 5%. So 95 plus percent did not talk about that. Less than 2% talked about penis size. 98% of women didn't talk about that. When they were talking about the men who were best in bed, didn't even rate, didn't even rate. And 0% talked about the man having a six pack or like a really nice body. So I think sometimes the things that men think are important about sex for women aren't tracking with what actual women are saying. And that's really important too, because I think if I were a man, I'd be intimidated based on what I see in porn. So we're, we're getting, and the, and the, the, the way that this relates is when a man is in his head and he's worried about his performance, he's not present with her. He's not really with her. He's not really tracking her responses. He's not paying attention to her breath. He's not giving her, giving her pleasure or hold, you know, holding her energetically, just being with her. And that's what so many women are actually craving. And that's what they're responding to. And that's what they're talking about in the research is, him being with me, the way he was with me, his taking his time, enjoying me, savoring me. I have a woman friend who's sleeping with a guy right now and their sex has improved over months because I think he's less worried about trying to stay hard. I think at the beginning, he was so worried about trying to stay hard that he was kind of in his head. And so he was, he was doing the jackhammer thing. Everything was kind of fast and hard and, you know, like this, because he was, trying to do something instead of, "Mm, I'm here with you. I'm enjoying this. I love your breasts. I'm, you know, I'm with you and I'm enjoying this moment. And that's, I think, really what's important to women. And that's not always what's depicted or, you know, that, like you said, that the on-ramp is kind of missing. So I think a lot of men are like, oh, that's not that important because it seems to work over here. So yeah, no, not for real, not for real women. And I think you know, your point is really important about lube because that that part is often cut out. You're not seeing the application of the lube. So you think that these women are just getting wet right away and he's he's digitally penetrating her like right away. And that that's she seems to enjoy that. No, 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 no. Touch her over her panties, right? Stroke her clit a little bit over her panties. Be gentle, really gentle, much less pressure than you think. It takes much less pressure than you think to get started. It's really, that's all really hot. And yeah, I, I, I agree. One of my visions is to have actual sex education, pleasure-based sex education and relationship ed in schools, in high schools and college to actually help people learn this because the idea that you're just supposed to be good at it without ever learning is silly. It's not really yeah. how it works with anything in life, really. That, and can we also like teach people about like balancing their checkbook and paying their taxes? Cause that's yes. another thing that they don't teach in school, which is like real life applications. Yeah, like who needs fucking home ec? Like I don't need to know how to like wood Make shop. Budgets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's fucking nonsense. Oh the God. stuff that they teach in school is just nonsense. Yeah. I saw a meme the other day that said like, wow, another day went by without me using like the Pythagorean. Yes, yeah, Pythagorean theorem. It's true. Theorem. I can't even pronounce it. It's been so long. Like, this is true. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh back to um what we were talking about with with porn. Um, yeah, I mean, I get, you know, the most common question I get asked is like, is penis size important? And it seems like no matter how many times I say that it's not, and a lot of performers that I interview say that it's not. Um I think, you know, it's just so drilled into men's head that it's like the most important thing because that's what they see in porn. And it's, and, you know, when you went back to talking about how sexuality and being good at sex is what defines someone's masculinity, that is so true. And, and, and also too, that even raises questions around like masculinity and what is masculinity and like, why do men like have to be so masculine and what does it mean to be a man? And like, could we maybe be a little bit more fluid in our like gender roles, but that's, that's a conversation for another time. Um, well, it's, it's kind of like the difference between leadership and healthy leadership. I think healthy leadership is what we're talking about, which is, Hey, I really want this to feel good for you. I always want to know 
you're leading there. And it's the same as a manager. Hey, I want this team to function well. I always want to know if there's something up for you. If there's anything you want to talk about, I'm here. And then following that up, right? Repeatedly saying, how, <clears throat> how are things at work? Especially if you have people in vulnerable uh, populations actually saying, I recognize that this is true. How, how are you? What's happening? I always want to know. Proactively eliciting feedback instead of being afraid of it and defending against it, that feels like the healthy masculine to me of I'm here, I'm holding the space, I want to know, I want to be better, I want to grow, I'm here. Instead of I have to have it all together and if I show that I don't, it means I'm less of something. I think that's really right. kind of what our world is calling for really is that kind of attuned leadership in all areas of eliciting feedback and then growing with it instead of thinking yeah. you already know. Yeah. One last thing I wanted to bring up about porn is that, you know, especially now after the me too movement and some other kind of, um, cleansing, cleansing social media discussions that, that, that we've had in our little porn bubble is that we do before a scene, what's called a boundary checklist. And so we sit down there with the performers and there's a whole list of things that you check off. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Fisting, fingering, um, rough, uh, face fucking, um, anal, like all these things. Right. And then we sit down on camera actually. Um, and I sit down as the director with them and we talk about it before the scene and a performer says, I, you know, I really don't like fingering or if you do fingering, I like it slow. Please make sure there's a lot of lube. Don't like dry finger me. Um, please don't go anywhere near my asshole. Uh, I love rough, um, face fucking. That's great. Do that. Um, I don't want hair pulling, like whatever, like we go over everything. And we also have nonverbal cues that we use as well. Um, and of course the performers have are free to call cut at any time, but they have nonverbal cues where the girl will do like a double tap on, um, the leg of the guy not facing the camera if he's going like too hard or too fast. So it's this kind of signal that doesn't like have this uncomfortable quality of having to stop the scene and saying like, cut, you're going too fast. It's just like a, Hey, slow down a little bit. And then the guy knows and he stops. Um, and then we also talk about what they love, like, you know, and girls will say, I love this. I love that. So all of these things are discussed before the scene even starts. So, you know, there is this, um, great example of like really explicit communication between the performers before they have sex. And this is not something that we do in our regular intimate but we sex should. lives. <laughs> but we should, if we could just institute the double tap that right there. Would be amazing. <laughs> I know. Right. <laughs> So, so yeah, that's just another thing to consider when you're watching a porn scene. And also too, I just want to bring up the fact that, you know, a lot of performers are like, they may not necessarily be like you, like they are often very sexual. They have this kind of like insatiable sexual appetite. Sex is their job. It's what they do every day. So they may have more extreme desires because, you know, when you do something for a long time, you get kind of jaded, you get kind of born and you push the boundaries. So when you look at, you know, the crazy stuff that like Adriana Chechik does, like you don't have to think that you need to be like her in order to be, you know, a great lover. And, you know, as a man, you shouldn't look at her and think like, that's what all women are like and all women want. Um, women are, are very different in their desires. And, um, I think that's like one of the key the key takeaways. Absolutely. And I think you'd be surprised at how, how fun and kinky women can be when they do feel safe and when they are coaxed out, right? When you're eliciting that from her and having her feel safe. That was actually one of the other things women talked about in terms of why they didn't talk to a partner was it wasn't all bad. It was sometimes th this one woman said, I have an easier time talking about what I want with a fling because I don't care what a fling thinks of me, but I don't want my partner to think I'm a trashy whore. And mm. we still have that sense of, I want to be the good girl. I want to make sure he respects me tomorrow. That's still real for a lot yeah. of women, myself included. I don't want to lose your respect. So for me to say, oh, I'd love to, for you to fuck me doggy style is an edge because I'm afraid that you're going to think that I'm trashy if I actually mm -hmm. express myself. So 
I've had men say like, I think it's really hot when you initiate. I think it's really sexy when you tell me what you want. Those are the men I'm more likely to tell, right? It's like when you're making it safe for me to share, I'm more likely to share versus I think a lot of men, they kind of take this lean back position of, oh, she'll tell me if she's interested, you know, well, she'll tell me if there's something for her to tell me, she'll, you know, she'll, she'll bring it up. And it's like, maybe, but if you create a space for her, if you invite her to share, she's a lot more likely to share. She's a lot more likely to share. And she's a lot more likely to, you know, do something like dress up when you're like, I think it's really hot when you wear something sexy that you love wearing, you know, just drop that as a hint. It doesn't have to be a big thing. Just, I find it really sexy when is a great prompt for you. I find it really sexy when you fill in the blank. It's like, she's got a choice there. She's probably going to do more of it. (laughs) And you, and you letting her know what you find sexy is, is empowering. You know, I think a lot of women are, they're still kind of inhibited and it takes something to, to break out of that and to, to come forward towards a man. Like you said, it sounds like you've also grown right in your relationship and feeling more empowered and communicating more. And, you know, it, it builds a lot of trust when both partners can do that. And I think that there's such a sacred role that men can play in eliciting our, our, our bigness, our fullness, our sexuality, because we, we are, I think, a lot of us afraid to share it because we don't want to look a certain way in your eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Melanie, thank you so much for coming on. This was such an incredibly interesting and informative episode. And I really hope and I think that um, my audience got a lot out of it. So yeah, really I hope so. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Can you, can you tell everybody where they can find you online and maybe a little bit more about this course that you teach? Yeah. So you can find me at MelanieCurtain.com, which will probably be in the show notes. The spelling is C-U-R-T-I-N, no A in my last name. And my course is there. I have one called Please Turn Bed, which we've talked about, and then one to overcome erectile dysfunction and premature ejaculation. And then if you're interested in coaching, you can just reach out to me directly. And if you have any feedback, I would love to hear it. (laughs) I would always love to, I always want to (laughs) know. I'm always interested in what you have to say. And so you can get me directly at dearmenpodcast at gmail.com as well. Fantastic. And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. And of course, if you want to support the show, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. I am also on TikTok, uh, where I put up little samples from this show. So if you want to get some interesting, quick little blurbs from past episodes, you can visit me at TikTok. I'm um, Holly Randall Unfiltered on there. Thank you guys so much for joining us and we'll see you next week. Manscaped has the men's grooming market down pat. Their Lawnmower 4.0 is the most revolutionary body hair trimmer on the market. They've also just launched their shampoo and conditioner, which is designed to help hydrate, nourish, and keep the hair that you want to keep on your head staying strong. Manscaped is really the one-stop shop for all your men's grooming needs. So go to manscaped.com and use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping.